What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Elevated Perspectives Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, and today I'll be sitting down with Nubia Young. She is the CEO and founder of Black and Tulum. We're going to talk about the rise of Black and Tulum, how she got started, her journey as a Gen Xer, and how she inspires other Gen Xers and women of color to get out there and travel more. So stay tuned. Well, welcome to Tulum. Thank you. Thank you. So you currently live in Playa del Carmen. I do. And you've been living nomadically for about five years. I just want to get the facts straight for people going who on may six, not. Going on six, yeah. <laughs> I've been living abroad going on six years. Uh, four of those six have been spent in Mexico. Okay. Um, the other two, actually I'm going on seven because two and a half years were in Thailand. And then um, I had some time in Germany and in Colombia. Wow. So you've been all over. I also noticed you've been living, you've lived on four continents yes. and visited over 44 countries now at 51 51 it changes year after year of course yes um so i definitely want to touch on that but today you're also an expat coach a motivational speaker yes a podcast host or was former (laughs) and of course ceo of black and tulum and black and travel so um tell us what black and travel is to you and like what inspired the creation of Black and Travel? So Black and Travel is the evolution of Black and Tulum. So when I began Black and Tulum, I didn't know that it would turn into this mm. huge Black travel travel movement in Mexico. Right. And um, it's been an amazing three years. We just stopped our three-year anniversary week. And um, it was just time for that, what I like to call the level up. Mm-hmm. So black and travel made sense. And we have 150,000 travel groups, businesses, pages, everything else. I just really wanted to do something encompassing of just travel and not putting a geographical term on it. Got it, got it. So making it more of a worldwide community. Correct. To open it up to multiple doors. I love that. I love that. And as you've been on this journey, I noticed another interview that you did, or maybe it was a write-up, but you wanted to really empower Gen X, women of color, to have some representation in that space. Absolutely, because representation matters. And, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. Yeah. And I just feel like, as a Gen Xer, we're considered like a lost art. You know, we're the ones that are supposed to be married, supposed to be taking care of our kids, supposed to be doing all these things Mm -hmm. and not really put ourselves as a priority and take care of us. It's taking, it's always an aging parent, a a partner, kids, you know what I mean? But when does it become about you and what makes you happy, what fuels your fire? Mm -hmm. So what a lot of people didn't know is that I started black and saloon at 40 i was over 40 actually um and uh, yeah i'm 45 now (laughs) currently during this interview and um we just had our three years so i started at 42 and i hear people all the time it's like oh i wish i would have done um you know moved earlier Mm -hmm. i wish i wish and i'm like no yeah it's not too late it's never too late so i really love to speak to the gen x community the millennials y'all are killing it (laughs) <laughs> y'all came through the door out the womb like can i get six figures please <laughs> well you all paved the way for us to do that you know i yes. think uh, a lot of times people like to look at um life as a clock and what i see gen x people typically do back home is like they're trying to wrap up their career or solidify their spot moving up that corporate ladder yeah. like you said taking care of family so i i think it's incredible to see people still starting projects at that age still moving abroad so we're living in an age where you can stay in touch with family with friends everybody's connected and it makes building community a whole lot i would think a little bit easier and more important at that right Mm -hmm. because one thing that i i you know when i speak to a lot of my guests the first thing they say is oh the facebook group has been amazing Mm -hmm. and i'm like my next question is has it been resourceful for you? Mm-hmm. And they're just like, oh my gosh, I did my whole itinerary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's what I can, that's what building a community. It's not just about Black and Tulum. Yeah. That's what building a community is about, is offering resources. resources. It's not about making yourself the priority. It's mm-hmm. about really creating a platform where others can shine. Right. And, and I think that for me, one of the reasons I've, I lived in Guadalajara last year, me and the whole family, 
And it was not a number one destination for expats and digital nomads in Mexico. There's Mexico City, there's Playa del Carmen, um, Merida. So we checked out all of those areas first, but what brought us to Guadalajara was the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. Everybody was so connected and intentional about their monthly meetups, plenty of kids for our kids to interact with. Nice. So that literally changed our whole experience. After about a year, we got we got bored. Yeah. Um, but uh, for me, I couldn't imagine a better jumping off place. And that's what resources. Exactly. I mean, sharing is caring, and um, that has always been what's important to me. I feel like I've always been a repository, right, of, of information, and I'm not going to gatekeep it. Mm -hmm. So when I started Black and Swoon, it wasn't a website. It wasn't a paid anything. Right. It was just a Facebook group. Mm. And when I started, it was 25 of us. And I started the Facebook group at the beach zone after a brunch that we had just had. And people were like, we need to stay in touch. And I'm like, you know, when you're abroad, WhatsApp is like the thing. The thing yep. But you can get lost in the threads. Right. So I was like, let me create a Facebook group. That group went from 25, we are now at over 25,000. That's crazy, 25,000 people. And you said you did not expect it to take the direction that it that it did. Yes. What were you thinking that Black and Tulum would be? Was it just the resources in Facebook? Like, where did the party aspect and nightlife come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my background is hospitality management. Okay. So my first event was a brunch. Mm. And it was a brunch because I would see a a sprinkle of um, people of color yeah. and I would be like yo let's get together yeah. and one thing that we do well is break bread mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I put together a brunch on the beach and 25 people showed up actually my first ever brunch was eight people but I never really count that <laughs> but you know the 20 so I was yeah. already putting together small you know meetups i'll say right. i won't call them events they were meetups but then they started growing mm -hmm. and then like the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth were like mm -hmm. 50 mm -hmm. 60 people and i'm like where are all these people coming from like right. were they in the were they <laughs> hiding <laughs> hiding because people want to bring their cousins or friends oh, they tell people about and that's school. why yeah. we started calling each other cousins and they'd be yeah. like hey fam yeah hey cuz so it just became a fam yeah and that's how they greet each other in the group chats and yeah. stuff like that in my group is what's up cousins i'm coming in and people i've noticed really do jump in and help out and yeah. be like oh here's a link to i stayed here yeah don't go here you know mm -hmm. this any other but um to jump back on what you're saying the events just started it's, it just got bigger and bigger the more people that came and then they started going so what's up where is the cold tonight yeah and then i was thinking about <laughs> it mm -hmm. maybe we need to do nighttime events mm -hmm. That's give, amazing. Yeah, give them what they want. Let it, yeah, let it grow naturally. And I think it's what was needed in, yeah. in this area. Um, and, you know, we could talk about Tulum a lot, but I really want to start on your journey, your story. So where are you from and what inspired you to make your first move abroad? Well, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Boston. Um, <laughs> being town. <laughs> um, but I left Boston about 25 years ago, so okay. I usually rep the DMV. Um, so I raised my kids in Virginia, Fairfax. And when I was 37, I got laid off. Mm. At my yeah. corporate meeting yeah. job. I was yeah. a, a corporate meeting planner. And I felt like I was on this, you know, tra work trajectory. Come back from Christmas vacation on top of that. And they're like, oh, you know, we're going to go in another direction. And I was furious because mm -hmm. I was like, how you guys know I'm a single mother. Mm -hmm. I have two kids at home. I just went, I just came back from Portugal. Right. I'm like, like, why are y'all doing this to me? Right. You get what I mean? It felt very, very personal. And then I swore off at that moment. I said, I'm never allowing corporate America to define my worth based on my title and my salary. That's powerful. That's powerful. And I think that we live our whole lives not even realizing it. I think a lot of us think the nine to five world is the safest option for us. Mm -hmm. But when they can make a decision just like that, or just you're like at the that. mercy of being hired, because a lot of times in your situation, people will want to look for that same title and that same base salary, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to go backwards. And that could be a lot harder to find. Yeah. So after getting laid off, it mm -hmm. propelled me 
to say there has to be something else out here. Okay. Luckily, I had already linked up with another travel group um, and I was doing small trips with them and I was just enjoying travel. And I said, you know what? And I'm not recommending that everybody do, you know, I was right. very radical right. in my moving. I was like, I'm off this, Me you too. know, <laughs> I'm done. It was like no real planning. I yeah. didn't have, I'm one yeah. of those that would throw a dart at a map or wherever it lands, I'm going, you know? Um, so I just got my 401k. I said, it's my money. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and I was furious with that because they take like 36%. Oh, yeah. And it's like, how are you taking so much money out of my money mm -hmm. that I put here for y'all to hold? you didn't follow the plan. Listen. The designated plan. On my way out the door, America was showing me all of their ass to kiss. Excuse yeah. my language. Yeah. No, you, can, you can cuss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. And I was like, oh, this is where I got to go. Yeah. I got to go. Yeah. That's amazing. By that time, were your kids grown at that time or like how did they oh i don't know i don't i mean what's grown to you <laughs> i guess 16 and up oh yeah so okay. my oldest i had just got off to college okay and the youngest was still in high school he was a junior if i'm not mistaken at the time gotcha. and so i just sent him to go live with dad <laughs> i mean this is listen I was trolled for a while for leaving the kids. And I'm just like, first of all, back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, shit, 20s, 60s, 70s, all that, people would leave their kids with their grandparents yeah. for decades. Yeah, I, I grew up, um, I'm Caribbean, West Indian, and uh, my mom was born in New York, my dad was born in the islands, but it was very common to say, hey, we're going to work here mm -hmm. and send you to live, you know, in the Caribbean for the summer, for a year, for two years. So Correct extremely common to chase that that goal that opportunity but i think a lot of times people don't like when you're just living but that's the thing you is know? like if i can't send him to his father where am i supposed <laughs> to send him that is you know what i mean it's his father i'm yeah. just like but when it yeah. it was evident that i wasn't a part of that equation mm. my mental health wasn't a part of that equation yeah my physical, financial, and, you know, and mental stability wasn't yeah. in that equation. It was just me as a mother yeah. that people seen me as and not as an individual. You know, across the board, moms have a lot of pressure on them yeah. to be the caregivers their whole life, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I can see that. So where were you off to the first trip? Move you know, there. I uh, went to Southeast Asia to thailand only because you would see video on top of video on youtube of these young white millennials yeah. with five dollars in their pocket and yeah. I, I had a lot more than five dollars so i said well if they can do it yeah. you know i can too yeah. and that's how my podcasting began because i realized that when i was searching for this um information around expat life i could not find anyone that looked like me not my color, mm -hmm. not, you know, my age group, not anything. I could not relate to any of these YouTubers. Yeah. So when I was talking to a good friend of mine about, you know, just kind of unloading like, yo, here we are over 30 going into our forties and nobody looks like us and da, 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 da. You know, um, she's 36 at the time and she was also you know in thailand and she had a son that she just got off to college so we had a lot in common yeah and we said we need to tell, talk about this absolutely you know we need to share these stories chronicle our journeys and that's how chronicles abroad came to be yeah, what's crazy is it's still similar today mm -hmm. you get on youtube and you want to find out what it's like to live in colombia what it's like to live in mexico and for the most part you're still not seeing a whole lot of black representation and um and for us it's it's family representation right you can do it as a single solo traveler yeah. with your significant other but what about the kids you know so i like to highlight that you know during our our content um specifically so while you're in southeast asia i'm sure that had to be a lot of culture shock I, you, or did it... listen y'all be surprised highs are like our cousins Wow. So they that's have, my thing is like the language. I'm like, how are y'all communicating? Listen, so a smile is a universal representation of hello, and Thailand is the land of smiles. You can talk with your eyes, right? Yeah. You you can share so many different, um, and what people don't understand is also in Thai, the words to say like hello and the masculine like to learn just a couple of phrases shows so much respect to them mm. 
I had lived in Thailand for, like I said, two two years plus, and I, I don't speak Thai, yeah. but I can say, I can welcome you and greet you. I can, you know, um, I can say goodbye and do just simple things, and they love that. Mm-hmm. I even learned how to say, how are you? You get what I mean? Yeah. Um, but my point to all that is don't allow that to hinder you, right? Because these are fears that you don't even realize mm-hmm. are su- suppressing you. And that's the next point I wanted to talk about is so many people get stuck on the planning stage, Mm -hmm. right? So one of the reasons we started this podcast is to really give information to people who are wondering and give representation to people who are hesitant or thinking about it or planning on it in the next 30, you know, 30 days or so. Mm -hmm. But people get stuck on planning and they never actually take the leap to move abroad. What would you think, something that you could tell listeners, you know, to stop procrastinating and just just do it well you know it's a double-edged sword when you say that because some people need to research mm-hmm. thoroughly yeah you know um others like i said like myself <laughs> i'm a thrill seeker i'm a risk taker um and i didn't have any other responsibilities but myself to go out there and i, I have that trust that i can do it yeah because i had already traveled yeah if you're not that kind of person, I would, you know, say, do your research to where it makes you feel comfortable. True. Just don't get analysis paralysis. Um, but this is where, you know, my coaching started coming in extremely handy because there are people that are on information overload and they feel like I just need some some help yeah. to be to guide my way through. Yeah. And that's how I created the novice to nomad because I know what it felt for me. So I wanted to provide um, a resource to women to help them take that step a lot easier. And with like, you know, the the arms back and the neck up yeah. and feeling like with confidence. With confidence. Because I think like if you're hesitant about this, you may find one bad review. It's like when you're looking at a restaurant, you find one bad review that talks you out of months of planning. Correct. So novice to nomad, we'll make sure we link that in our uh, description at the end of the episode. So. Um, do people sign up for consultations with you and then move from there? And do you help yeah. them guide, guide them on different cities or do you focus on specific cities or countries? So um, we had originally launched Novice to Nomad um, in early 2020. Okay. Right when, no, 2019, sorry, 2019. So right before the and pandemic. And then right before the pandemic. Yeah. And so um, this is the, the level up or the revamp of it, but it's going to be more like a membership. So that way the members can talk with to each other mm-hmm. you can connect because it can't just be me. Mm-hmm. Right? We yeah. need to rely on community. That's what the whole point is, building right. a platform where community can, can, you know, get together. My work in this is to hold like, you know, weekly one-on-one, not one-on-ones, but group chats where we can speak. So if they have advanced questions, I can be there to assist those questions and they have access to me. Right. You know what I mean? Um, because it's so beautiful to see one one person's questions go into a oh yeah me too i was thinking the same thing i love that but nobody speaks up and it's like yeah let's come on let's talk yeah i love that because um resources like where to rent a car what school are you sending your kid to um you know co-working spaces accommodations because it's different city to city country to country um so i love that and also helping others who have already been to that country yes been living there thriving there so that's amazing um, so, okay, so we'll get back on track. So you were in Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. Um, were you popping around to different countries, returning home? What did that look like for you? So I went to Bangkok first, busy, okay. busy, busy. Okay. And then I set my eyes on Chiang Mai because of the Lantern Festival. Anybody who knows, you mm-hmm. know, the lunar calendar. And in the fall, they have these beautiful uh, floating uh, you call them kind of like paper lamps yeah. in the sky. So... I thought that was a great way to transition my life to the next level, was to let go of some things, to put some things into the universe that I wanted and to start manifesting. And so Chiang Mai fell in love. I love that. And I, I I've mean, heard great things about Chiang Mai. Fell in love and found a whole black community in the end. I want to go so bad. I want to go so bad. Me and my wife, we're going to book those one-way flights and please get over there. Please do. Please do. There's an amazing community. Mm-hmm. We actually created dinners every Sunday, you know, with a group called the Black Packers. Mm-hmm. And nobody knew who they were. And then I land in Thailand and I was like, 
I mean, the first I got to the hostel and it was two black girls from DC. Yes, it. Yes, I, I love that. <laughs> so you're never alone. Yeah, because yeah. mm -hmm. when you land and you see black people, it's instantly what's up, and then you'll see the, where they're from, find out their yeah. stories. Even us finding this little space right here was amazing. So black owned co working space. So building community was always important to you as a solo traveler. A building community has always been important to me as a woman mm. <laughs> and, yeah. a, and a mom. Yeah. You get what I mean? Yeah. Um, it just became that much more important as a traveler, you know, because usually people travel within their friend group or um, travel group and that's where they stay. Mm -hmm. It's like their safe bubble. But how much did you really learn about that country or that city or that place that you went to if you stay in a bubble? Yeah. You got to kind of get out and kind of break out and explore. And the best, I, in my opinion, the best exploration happens sometimes when you're by yourself because you don't really have anybody, you know, tapping you on the back. Like, are you ready? Yeah. I'm hot. I'm hungry. <laughs> it's just so, you. So when it comes to collaborating and building community with the local culture, so what was that like in, in Thailand and even here in Mexico? Like, are you also building that community with local establishments, businesses? Yes, I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because in Thailand, I didn't have a lot of Thai friends. And it's because you, you don't bring people that look like me home. Got you. So, so culturally, even though they'll, you know, not, I don't want to use the word tolerate you, they'll embrace you. Mm -hmm. It's just culturally and traditionally, you yeah. don't date. Yeah. You know, a person outside of the race, unless they're white European. Yeah. So they gatekeep their culture a little bit, especially from black it's and brown. It's more the ancestors, like yeah. older people. You know what I mean? So the people my age at the time, yeah. 40, didn't have a lot of black friends. What about colorism out there? I mean, Asian I know it's. definitely has colorism. Yeah, that's what oh. I've been thinking. Like, oh, I know they have a bit of a, not a caste system per se, but, you know, the darker skinned Asian people and just black people in general are looked down upon maybe doing more labor work um, mm -hmm. versus lighter skinned people. So you did experience. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. However, as an American, you'd be surprised you have that American privilege, mm -hmm. right? So they would see me immediately um, believe that I came from Africa mm -hmm. and I was, I've was i been called, they, they think they're calling me a name. They're like, you know, Congo or, you know, Africa. Mm -hmm. And you're like, um, <laughs> are you trying to say something? Yeah. Like what? Yeah. But, the moment I opened my mouth, and even if I said something simple as, okay, they're like, American? And I'm like, yeah, they're like, America. Yeah, because you got that blue passport and that, that money. Exactly. So, so they changed their tune. But I've also yeah. had colorism happen in, in Africa. Man, and like, that's one thing we have experienced in Spain and Europe, different parts of Europe, because they're thinking you're coming from Africa. Or even in Latin America, once they think yeah, you're from Haiti, the Dominican Republic, right? But as soon as they hear that accent, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah embrace you. Come on in. Come on. <laughs> um, and so I think for us as black travelers, we have we have a unique experience with, I think what's popular now is, are we gentrifying an area as we're coming in with our American USD? But also we have to deal with discrimination and anti-blackness everywhere that we go. Yeah, that's the sad part about life, it is. right? It's not just, you know, I tell people all the time, travel is transformative. And I'm so proud of you guys for taking your kids and traveling with them, because to me, that is the greatest gift that you can pass down to your Thank children. Thank you. Thank you. So kudos to you. Gentrification in general, and that has happened here in Tulum. Mm -hmm. When I first landed here, it was nothing but jungle. There was some construction and there were no Afro parties is what they like to call them. And when I started, you know, started hosting events and hosting parties and more, people started flocking. Tulum became the number one travel destination three years in a row. That's amazing. That's amazing. And like, it used to be, from what I read is it was kind of off the beaten path. And it was, I think Tulum was um, centered in a magazine piece as having some of the best beaches in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's when the tourists came. Well, it was, um, it was leaked that um, DiCaprio comes here for his 
vacation. Yeah, of course, paparazzi, constant yes. pictures. And then yeah. also for the people of color, when Black and Tom started, it was right after Nipsey's death. So when Nipsey did the victory lap and mm-hmm. he talked about being at the Mayan, you know, oh, remember sitting yeah. up smoking a cigar at the yeah. Mayan. Yeah. <laughs> and he says Tulum in his song. Yeah. So it, people, you know, black people, where's this Tulum thing? And then if you find a group called Black and Tulum, mm-hmm. then it's like, oh, to, there's black people there. Right. And then we're showcasing, you know, us on the beach chilling. So just make people feel more comfortable. I was hosting lives and giving people information because nobody knew that you could travel because I started the group in 2020. Yeah. We had nowhere to go. So, so I they were telling you. Out of your travels, right? So you were in Southeast Asia. I know mm-hmm. you spent some time in, in Europe as well. Africa? Mm-hmm. What countries in Africa? Currently, I've only spent time in South Africa, Johannesburg, Cape Town. That was beautiful. Um, actually, yes, I'm actually going back. I've been, uh, I went last year mm-hmm. and I'm going back this year. Mm-hmm. And um, it's going to be a second home. Nice. That's how much I love it. Nice. And so out of that, like, what landed you in Mexico? I know the pandemic was coming around the time that you got here. You got here before the pandemic. I got here before the pandemic. And when I got to Mexico, I moved to Mexico City. Mm, Tell us about that experience. Mexico City is amazing. Have you been? I have. We spent only a week because we were in Guadalajara. We kept meaning to go over there. Mm -hmm. We only got to go for like one week and I got sick. But I know the food was amazing. It's a huge city, bustling, mm-hmm. so much to do for the kids. Um, what I didn't love was the pollution. Of course. Um, but it's of a cool, major but, city. But it was, it was amazing. I mean, you can't touch all of Mexico City in one week. So yeah. how about your experience there? It was just like you said, it was amazing. The food culture, the um, museums, the parks. Yeah. I fell in love with Mexico City. And then september rolls around in october and i was like wait it's cold oh yes oh <laughs> i was like i got to go because <laughs> we don't start on this journey to be cold we... like let me tell you i i grew up in toronto uh-huh. um made my way to atlanta and once i got to atlanta i'm like i would never live back in canada ever again <laughs> right um, and then you go to mexico and it's just like well atlanta's too cold in the winter too so i stay gone in the winter so so then we're not about that life no. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so when it started getting cold, I was like, I got to go. Yeah, yeah. So then you you heard about Tulum or the Riviera Maya? I actually came okay. to uh, Playa because there was a small community of travelers that I yeah. knew from you know the Facebook uh, pages and my travel groups, and so I came to just link up with them, and I got t- tired of Playa very quickly. It was touristy yeah um and i was just like i need some peace somewhere i can go and that's when i came to tulum wow what year was that this was um what year are we in we're in 2023 (laughs) i forget what day it is half the time and that's another thing people need to realize when you're a nomad if you don't have a a, a nine to five Mm -hmm. you lose your days yes because it just kind of it's like what month are we in and then you stop worrying about that and you're like what year are we in (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm at the what year are we in phase. No. And when I go back home, it's so funny because I think that everyone is living kind of like me mm-hmm. a little bit. And I get back and it's like, no, people are living a whole different lifestyle, stressed. Absolutely <laughs> stressed. stressed. Um, but to answer your question, I came in 2019. Okay. Yes. And so there was, it was jungle back then, I'm sure. And, and I'm sure they had a few, like Koba Ave was here. Um, one oh, direct road to the beach. When I, it was like straight up different. Yeah, I can't really explain it. But even oh, I, I can't explain it. If now to me, it's almost like it, when I came here, it was a village. Now mm. it's a town. Town, yeah. It's it come back in two years. It's gonna be a city. A city, exactly. <laughs> That's how I can explain it. What made you fall in love with with Tulum? I, I guess Tulum and. I know you got tired of pretty quickly, but what made you get fall in love with Tulum going from a big city like Mexico City to here? It was different. It was peaceful. It was riding your bike to the beach. It was very much that um, small, quaint town that yeah. had great tacos and beautiful cenotes. Yeah. And I mean, we have over like 7,000 cenotes, so you can, sh- and none of them are ever alike. Mm-hmm. So, 
being here in Tulum before it became the hottest destination, it was, it still is, but it was a magical place. It's a vortex. Yeah. And there was, there's so much to experience. It's so much more to experience than what people see on Instagram and TikTok. Like, that's just scratches the surface. Yeah, I know the first time we came was 2021. So I think travel had just started to open up a little bit. Um, and we got here, me and my wife, first we went to Playa. I talked about Merida a little bit too, but Tulum was magical. Uh, my skin was glowy, my teeth were whiter being here. And like you said, we were going to cenotes, cooking classes, um, different experiences, riding our bikes to the beach. Um, but I know that for us, we did miss that city aspect a little yeah. bit. Um, do you ever get away and just say, hey, I need I need more more infrastructure or do you feel like you're getting well that's here? why i landed in Playa afterwards you know because mm -hmm. even even though something as like this interview yeah the electricity can go out like this mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed, <laughs> fingers crossed yeah. but tulum is unstable yeah so i would have you know zoom meetings and i would be like hello you guys are all stuck in the next you know it's just i had it and i was like i can't Mm -hmm. And that's what brought me to Playa. Okay. Is I understood that I, I needed um, a better um, infrastructure. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so let's talk about Black and Travel and Black and Tulum a little bit more. So when you did start um, the business, did you have, was it just you? Did you have any like team it's helping been me you? For, well, I didn't, I didn't have teams such as like employees. I had people who were volunteering and helping like, oh my God, this is great. You know, if you yeah. need anything, let me know. And I had to learn to start asking for help. Yes. Because um, a lot of people feel that they have, that's my baby. I got to do this. Nobody's going to do it like me. And that all can be true. But it does take a village to foster and to nurture and to um, help just blossom. Yeah, I, I can see that. I don't know when we reached out to you for the interview. You're like, yeah, I have my assistant um, scheduled. I'm like, OK, my assistant. I know that feels good. I know I mean, that feels good. I have good. over 12 employees now. That's amazing. And not, and not, and not helpers, like employees yeah. paying salary. And um, that is very scary, right, because you have to make sure that you're able to deliver to pay these people month to month right so um that is that's kind of where i'm in the beginning stages we're doing a lot of content creation right and so we've tried outsourcing to folks on fiverr kind of people that you don't know too well mm -hmm. do you feel like you are working more along the lines with people that you have met or are you saying hey who's best for the job to get this done um i had invested and hired a business coach um for myself because i know that my mind works at 150 miles a minute yeah and when i tried to do it alone i was hiring from the bottom up which meant mm -hmm. that if i'm hiring an assistant not like um you know i don't know somebody to handle the emails you know i had to onboard them i had to do all these things and i didn't have the time yeah. and then i'm just like here do it like yeah not, and i wasn't being the leader that i needed to be but when i hired somebody to help me like clear the fog and say hi rock you know hi rocky ceo you know general manager manager you get what i mean yeah. broke it down yeah. and we made position descriptions and we did all of these things yeah. and then we started hiring executive level and brought it so down. So kind of like how to structure a business. Correct. On one. That's that's great. So do you um so do you consider them a mentor in their space or is it like hey this is a working relationship? It was a working relationship. Okay. I'm paying you per month to help me complete these goals that my company needed to be that's completed. Really cool. And I think that's the thing about it is it's so scary to bank on yourself, especially when you're putting down money. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know if you're going to make that back or if you can substantiate, right? Paying this amount monthly. So I, it was very important to me to believe that whatever I'm putting into my business is going to come back tenfold. 
How did that inspiration come about internally? Because you've started other projects before. You've started other Facebook groups, communities before. What was it about this that said, I'm betting 100% on myself? I mean, the community literally came out. I mean, I would sit at my events mm -hmm. and be in a corner and be like, there are 300 black people from all over the world so here. seeing it come to fruition Correct. as you are working on it. Okay. I, I cried the first year of yeah. Black and Tulum, like almost every event, like, wow. There was never a day where I didn't pack a house since I started. So, and, and then people started talking about it. And then celebrities started showing up. Athletes started showing up. Yeah. You know, um, high, high level influencers started showing up. And I was just like, people are talking. You get what I mean? And I'm listening. Like, what do you need? How can we assist you? So then we created Black Card Elite, which actually is our concierge business. Because okay. you got all these people coming and they were asking questions in a Facebook group like, what airport do I fly into? <laughs> I was like, well, if y'all got to go all the way back to the basics, we yeah. might as well just put this in a little yep. wrap bun You'll for you. You'll be amazed at the questions you get online. But and, you listen to, but, if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. listen to your audience. Yep. Yep. That's why we started a podcast. Because, you know, people are asking us, hey, you know, how do you go about doing this? How do you go about doing that? What do you, what do, you do for work? And I'm like, hey, there's no one way to do this, right? So let's tell other people's stories to bring them in and say, hey, if you're an entrepreneur, you need to listen to Nubia. If you are, you know, a, a cook, a chef, mm -hmm. you know, a hairdresser, like there are so many ways to sustain yourself Absolutely. abroad. What were you doing in the early years? I know you had just gotten laid off. Yes. Yeah, so when I had got laid off, I came and I came into Thailand yeah. with my little pimp step, like I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> I lived the retiree life for uh -huh. almost a year. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking at that bank account like, wait. I forgot that I'm not, nothing's coming in. Nope. Mm -hmm. And it goes quick. And it goes quick. Yeah. Um, so I ended up doing something I never thought I would ever do. And that is teach English abroad. Which back then was, was lucrative. Oh, it was nice. It was, it was what you made it, right? Because okay. there were so many companies. If you were like a really great teacher, you can make, I don't know, 1500 a month. Yeah. To a lot of people, you're going to be like, what? 1500 a month? You know, I make 1500 you know, a day, a week, whatever. But when you're living in Asia and your studio apartment is $325 mm -hmm. and it comes with electricity and a housekeeper, like your actual bills plus groceries are $500 a month, then 1500 a month is excellent it's what you need yeah so i love that need. were you a good teacher i was i was because i'm a mom so yeah, yeah i had this whole little desk set up and with my little abcs i went to the, you know you go to the dollar store and pick up crafts yeah so i went to the thai dollar store and picked up all these you know crafts and i had this beautiful backdrop and um it's funny with every this is another thing with everything that i started doing I people were asking me all the time about it so then i created <laughs> side hustle remote side hustles and that was me helping people yeah. learn english and teach english learn how to teach english abroad and get their tefl certifications and all of that yeah so that was another little income that i was bringing in right. on top of the vip kit that's what i was working for and i think this lifestyle really inspires you to get creative um, you have to you have to you know because you want to free up your time not be attached to that nine to five or find the right nine to five and that's kind of the position that me and my wife have been in yeah uh, for the past few months so um, as far as getting creative and building that community, I know you had one friend um, who was already living in Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, she was in a, the, the program for TEFL. Okay, um, so so that's kind of how y'all kind of worked. At, the, at that time, no. Okay. I just knew her from the, the Washington, D.C. area. But I'm just saying, like, you know, we were out there making do with what we had mm -hmm. and what we wanted to do. And she did the, the local teacher route. She was an actual teacher in Thailand. Yeah. I did teach online. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, 
and then people started getting into coaching and then people started learning, you know, different things in that country, like, you know, Thai massage. And then it was, you know, it just goes on and on and on, yeah. you know, and then from one opportunity can lead to another. Yes. I love the fact that, you know, you don't have to be tied directly to the United States for your opportunities. No. Right? You can continue to find new people, essentially new communities. Um, and it just breeds opportunity. I love that. It does. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are other people that were doing creative things, painting, singing, mm -hmm. comedy shows. I mean, it went on and on. And I was just like, wow, I'm in Thailand watching this big black man do poetry. <laughs> you know what I mean? At a little kind of speakeasy that... Right was created for expats and locals to get together. Yeah. I never knew. And I've, I've seen it too. I've seen people pick up new skills along the yeah, way. I absolutely. think that's part of the journey as well. You know, if you're a photographer amateur wise, you can come out and be a professional photographer. You know, you can kind of reinvent yourself. So made a lot of photographers yeah. very much well known. Yeah, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. I've definitely seen that. Okay. Well, you have really been thriving abroad right currently living in playa how does your family feel about about this all today i know they weren't very supportive in the beginning um have they come around family and friends um i think that when again fear sets in mm -hmm. it's like how dare you and why would you do that you know <laughs> um but no it hasn't been a situation where family has been necessarily the most supportive mm -hmm. i will say that my son lives with um you know his friends down here in mexico really? and That's so cool. yeah he gave me a call one day and yeah. was like i think i'm ready to come abroad yeah. yeah and i said well come on you know um so my son has made a life here for the last two years that's amazing. And yeah, my daughter's like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it takes a little bit of people getting a taste of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I always tell friends to just come down and visit, right? If, if you're missing me, if you think, you know, um, what, I, what I'm doing isn't, you know, fully supportive, then, you know, stay, stay where you're at. But yeah. if you're interested, just come down, take a trip and go back and see what you think. But I think the thing about it is, you know, again, people were so concerned with how our families think and you know how it impacts others and yeah. oh what about my aging parent what about my aunt what about my grandparent and it's like the only thing in this world that's finite is our death if you can't live your life because you're so focused on everybody else's yeah. you're gonna miss out yeah it's not your life and if COVID didn't teach anybody anything it was it could be taken up and like you know yeah in the blink of an eye yeah um in ways that you never knew you know what i mean so it, it this is the time this is the time to restructure things we have the gentle parent movement right mm -hmm. we have the nomad mo you know movement exit yeah. movement um there's no more status quo to life it's get out and live it the way you want we got the uh tiny home movement mm -hmm. the people living out of their cars some of them because they got you know yeah, laid RVs, off RVs, RV, RV. Going around and um the digital nomad you know aspect of like hey you can work remotely from anywhere change the game i think a lot of people have, still haven't woken up to that idea of like if you're living working in your living room you can technically with permission, maybe without, you know, work in Mexico, work in Thailand, you know, yeah. get out and see the world, take some risks. And, well, the countries um, are coming out with visas specifically for digital nomads. Yeah. So whatever, if you are interested in working abroad, mm -hmm. you know, it is illegal to come into a country and work without the proper visas or it permissions. Is. It um, but it's, it's nice to look into, right? Mm -hmm. Does this country offer a visa for you know digital nomads yeah this any other because a lot of countries do yeah. and you know it's amazing to see what has grown mm -hmm. in these last five years in the travel space around families around people of color around women of color around you know lgbt it's just been amazing to see the growth because you didn't yes. see it before yeah. I know you're in the process of scaling, leveling mm -hmm. up your businesses, multiple businesses. Where do you see Black and Tulum and Black and Travel? Like, where do you want to take it? So I'm retiring Black and Tulum in five years, and we just celebrated three, so I have two more years. Okay. And I plan on retiring or stepping down. 
um, because I feel like I would have did my time yeah. like I think there's time to let something go when you know you feel like I've, I've done all I can do for you baby like my baby is, is is done so I'm using black and Tulum as that stepping stone to open up doors for all of these other projects that you know I can't necessarily name right out loud but um, there are some amazing things coming down the pipeline and yeah. the connections that are being made through Black and Tulum at my events and, you know, people walking up and saying, yo, this is dope. I would love to collaborate with you. Yo, this is amazing. I want to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And I'm in a room where I manifested saying to the universe, like, I just want to be in the right rooms, not knowing that I created some of them freaking rooms. Preach. I was just like, wow. <laughs> and that's wisdom right there to know, hey, I think that this is coming to an end, um, but you still have all these doors that you want to pursue because there's only so much time in a day to yeah, work on a project, it. right? So and knowing get some rest. exactly, <laughs> get some rest and live your life, you know, and, yeah. take a vacation because you know just because you live abroad doesn't mean you're on vacation. So um, look, I, I love that, and I do want to continue to follow the journey. Thank and thank you. you again for just taking the time out. Thank to, you for having me. To answer these questions with us. This has I been amazing. I appreciate it. And listen, keep doing what you guys are doing. And, you know, um, it's, I think it's important to have people of influence, right? Not necessarily influencers, you know, necessarily the way we see it today, but people of influence, like, that can help aspire others you know to help others say well if they can do it i can also yeah to say oh there is another way yeah and telling that story you know we don't want to just be influencers that work for brands correct that's what i meant and by that. saying like oh yeah stay at this hotel and it's when you know that hotel wasn't it you yeah know what i mean so we want to really tell a story um and help others that's that's why we got into this so, so thank you um, for hope... being people of influence that's yeah, all i want I think, to say i think this story will really inspire others nubia um you know we're gonna stay connected and if we need a part two this is a remote podcast too so hey. um, we may catch up with you, you wherever catch you are me in the world, in the world. <laughs>